uh, thank you for the reading of your word, I should say. And I pray, Lord, as we are going to preach your word and to teach your word, I pray, Lord, that you help us to understand your word and uh, open our hearts, open our minds to assimilate it and not just be hearers alone, but doers of your word also in Jesus' name. All right. Second Peter, sorry, First Peter chapter 5. As the, I, the title of my sermon this evening is Final Exhortations. Final Exhortations. There's just a whole lot of range of things that Peter touched as, uh, in, as he was concluding his letter to, to the strangers scattered around in Asia Minor. So I just call it Final ex Exhortations. And um, remember that the chapters, the verses were all added to help reference the Bible. The Bible did not come with chapters and verses, right? So these are all just references to help you understand the Bible. The whole thing reads as one letter. So always keep this in mind when you're reading the Bible, uh, especially these letters. So I'll start from verse 1 here. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Open to Titus chapter 1. Elder is synonymous for bishop and pastor. Bishop and pastor also mean elder. So in Titus chapter 1, that makes it very clear. So you say, who are the elders? So who is he exalting? Is he just exalting the, uh, the old people in church? No, he's talking about the bishops and the pastors. Remember, he's writing to a bunch of strangers, various churches scattered around. When I say strangers, uh, not the Jews. Various churches scattered around uh, in Asia Minor. And he's saying the elders among you, the bishops, the pastors among you. So let me prove that to you. In Titus chapter 1, in verse 4, the Bible says to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause, let I thee, that's Paul is saying, I left you, Titus, let I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders. You see, elders is a position to be uh, that uh, for that requires ordination. And ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless. So ordain elders, right? If any be blameless. So ordain the people that are blameless, uh, they, they can be elders. He says, for a bishop must be blameless. So you just interchange the word. For an elder must be blameless. That's why you should ordain those that are blameless. So for a bishop must be blameless, a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. If you compare the requirements of uh, ordination for an, el for an elder to be ordained, it's the same with the requirements in that P Paul himself said in First Timothy chapter 3. So it's just a quick proof there in the same text. He used elders and interchanged it with bishop. So he's talking about he's talking to the elders at this point. He's concluding his letter. He said, the elders among you I exhort. So Peter says I also am an elder. So it's not just saying, oh I'm old now. <laughs> right? He's saying I also am a bishop. I'm a pastor. Because he was appointed by Jesus Christ. Every elder has to be appointed by the Lord. Every el a, and Only an elder can appoint another elder. So Titus was appointed, so him too has to go and appoint elders. So he was appointed by Jesus Christ because Jesus put him in charge. Upon this rock I'll be in my church. So Jesus when I appointed him as an elder, ordained him as an elder. And remember, Peter was married at the time. So I'm highlighting this because of the Catholics. So Peter was the first pope, he's the head of the church, he's the leader of the church. He was married at the time. He had kids, he had a wife. In fact, Jesus, you know, but Jesus did not know that he was married. Jesus went to heal his mother-in-law. Okay? So Jesus knew that he was married. <laughs> so, um, so Peter is not the first pope, right? Because he's not a pope. I understand. Pope means father. It's just a different language. Peter was a father, true. But he was not, you know, the Catholic pope, as they call pope. Um, so he, Peter met all the qualifications according to the Bible to be an elder. So he said, I also am an elder. He goes on to say also he's a witness of the sufferings of Christ. That means he was a disciple. He was with Jesus. Uh, he stayed with Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus. That's what he's trying to say. And specifically he was an apostle too. So even going a lot uh, uh, further. And a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So he was not just a disciple, but he was saved. You know, uh, who else was a disciple that was witness the sufferings of Christ, uh, at least not all of it, but some of it, um, or sort of the beginning of it. 
who is that? Judas Iscariot. So he was not just a disciple of Jesus Christ, but he's, a, he's going to be a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So he was saved. That's what he's trying to say. I'm saved. I suffer for Christ. And you know, if you suffer with him, you reign with him. All right, let's look at verse 2. Feed the flock of God. So he's talking to the elders now. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, not uh, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Open to John 21. So feed the flock of God. So he starts off as his concluding letter. He starts off with the elders, telling them what are the elders supposed to do? Feed the flock. What does feed the flock mean? Why, why is that phrase in the mind of Peter? Yes, the, God wrote the Bible. But you can see that each book is kind of tailored according to the personality that God used to write it. Right? So don't just say, oh, those people are just robots writing it. No, it's according to their personality. But what they said was truth. It's just like preaching the gospel. One way I preach the gospel, as I, as I explained, my default way I preach the gospel. You can preach it, use different Bible verses, uh, use different examples, but you're using the word of God and it's still, you know, spiritual. So that's how the Bible too was written. All right, so this was imprinted in Peter's head. Why? In John chapter 21, let's read from verse 15. Uh, in fact, before I read that, I'll tell the story real quick. So Jesus died, he has risen, Peter doesn't know, and Peter goes a fishing, and he tells the other disciples, hey, let's, I'm going to fish, basically. I'm going to fish. And they're like, oh yeah, we'll go with you. Because Peter had this character of people following him. He was someone that, you know, you could follow. And they all followed him. I mean, because he was their leader. I mean, they know that Jesus appointed him as the leader too. So they followed him to go fishing. Instead of going to fish for men, they went to fish for fish, I guess. And uh, Jesus appears, or shows up there, and uh, he told them to come come down and John is like, oh, he's the master. And they were so afraid, they were ashamed of themselves. I should have just been reading this, right? I'm just telling the story. <laughs> anyway, Jesus makes fish. He brings fish. They left their fish and everything, but he brings fish, bread, and he's feeding them. And while they are eating, I'll read, pick up the story from verse 15. John 21. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? What are these? The fish and the bread and food. Lovest thou me more than these? He, he said unto him, Yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. Verse 16. He said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, verse 17, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Don't you, do you think he'll ever forget this? I mean, he was caught red-handed with his pants down, literally because he had to wear his pants. He was naked. The Bible said he wore his clothes <laughs> and jumped into the water. So, uh, and Jesus made him grieved for this. Jesus was trying to imprint it in his head. That's why I give some crazy examples sometimes, just so that the things I say will imprint in your head. And my kids know this very well. You know, I give like extreme examples, just so that you remember this. I, I want it to be associated with another memory. So Jesus associated, you know, that grief. Like, but I love Jesus. So if you love him, feed my sheep. Peter, you are the pastor. You are the elder. Feed my sheep. Don't lead them astray. Amen? Open to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. So what does it mean when he's telling them, feed the flock? In Psalm 23, it makes it very clear. It means to lead the church of God according to the word of God, according to what Jesus says, because he is the chief shepherd. In Psalm 23, the Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. See, the shepherd will take the sheep, uh, but the sh he cannot force the sheep to eat. Right? You can take the horse to the stream, but you cannot force the horse to drink. So you, you have to lead the, the sheep to green pastures. You have to lead the sheep where the word of God is. Show, give. I can preach the Bible. Tell you, hey, don't steal. Don't do this. Don't do that. But I cannot force you to do those things. 
feed the sheep. I'm feeding you the word of God. It's up to you to do it. Right? So lead the church. Teach the church the word of God. Feed the church the word of God. That's why he's telling them. He's exhorting the elders. So Jesus told Peter, you're going to be a fisher of men from now on. But Peter went to lead them to fish for fish. And Jesus is like, don't you love me more than this fish? You get a picture now. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, uh, this is what Paul said to Timothy. If thou put the brethren, uh, the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So you'll be nourished up to feed them, right? Because you cannot give someone something you do not have. So, but how are you doing it? By bringing all these things to their remembrance. You're feeding the sheep, right? So it says, feed uh, the flock, well, let me keep reading verse 2, feed the flock which is among you. So he didn't just say, oh, feed all the flock of Jesus Christ. See, this is where it goes to church, churches, right? There's not just one universal church, and there's one guy above it, the Pope, and Peter is supposed to feed all the flocks. If he's supposed to feed all the flocks, why is he telling the elders there to feed the flock, right? He cannot just preach one sermon, and in all the churches, they'll be showing that sermon on TV. They didn't have TV back then, so I don't know how to do that. Anyway, but that's what they're doing now. They're abusing technology, right? It's churches, and the pastor is supposed to rule that, as he says there. supposed to rule there. He's supposed to teach them there. He's supposed to feed them there. And if they're not being fed, they should go to where they, are being, where they can be fed. Amen? So... So it says, which is among you? Which is why I give church members, those that attend church, I give them preference over internet viewers. Right? If a church member calls me up to ask me something, I'll, that's higher priority than somebody I don't know calling the church, hey, I, don't, I have this question. I, show up. <laughs> They'll answer your questions. Right? Because God says, I should feed the ones that are among me, the ones that are here. That's what the Bible says. So I. How do I discern the preference or the priority? The ones that are among you, the, the ones that are among the elders, the ones that show up in church. Amen. And church services, the preaching is tailored for the people that are here. Right? Oh, but he's an internet viewer. He just clicked on the internet and he's listening to my sermon. He didn't know that I preached about this last week. Too bad. <laughs> right? It's just too bad. Show up. Which is among you? So I'm feeding them step by step. We're growing, right? I, what I see, what needs to be changed, how to help people. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling. Not, I'm, I'm not preaching to the internet. I'm preaching to those that are among you. Now, the internet is a perk. Obviously, YouTube is a perk. It's a tool also. It's, it's an advantage that we have. Oh, we can listen to the sermon all over again, right? You can say, oh, pastor, this is where you made a mistake right here. I'm, I'm just kidding. All right, you can listen to the sermon all over again, and I can learn from me too. So it's a perk, it's a tool, but understand that I'm preaching to the people that are sitting on, people that are here. So attend church services. That's what that means, in case you didn't get it. You say, oh, but every word of God is for me, except this one. It's talking to the elders. No, it's talking to you. That if you want to be fed, attend church services. So every word of God is for you. Amen? So it's taking the oversight thereof. This simply means to rule. When you're taking the oversight of something, you're, it means you're overseeing something. In 1 Timothy 5.17, the Bible says, 1 Timothy 5.17, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in word and doctrine. So when it says rule, rule is not just an evil word, right? Husbands rule their wives. It doesn't mean that they are dictators. In fact, when I say dictators, it's not even an evil word too. <laughs> I dictate what goes on in my house. Yes, I'm a dictator, right? But there's a benevolent dictator, just like God. God dictates what goes on, right? Doesn't mean that he's evil. No, he's benevolent. He's good. He's merciful. He's that. So rule, it says rule well. So is it not he's beseeching us, is adjoining us to the rulers to rule well, then you'll be counted a worthy, uh, double, worthy of double honor, as the Bible says. So taking the oversight just means rule. You elders, feed the flock, those are among you, taking the oversight thereof. So it's telling you to rule. But it says, not of constraint, but willingly, right? And because ruling, being the, the, the bishop, being the elder, is not by force. It's not something you say, oh, I have to do uh, 
I must do it, or you're being forced to do it. Oh, I just, I just have to rule them. No, it's something you have to do willingly. And that's why the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire it a good work. So it's something you have to desire. Uh, and I'm talking to those that, you know, want to be an elder, those that are aspiring, you know, want to grow up and, you know, be an elder. That's a grow up. It doesn't, I mean, when I'm old, or <laughs> in future, how about that? <laughs> I'm used to talking to my kids, guys, so sorry. <laughs> in future, I want to be an elder. So, yeah, it's something you have to desire. And you, you, you can't just say, oh, because my dad is an elder, then I'm going to be an elder. Or because this person is an elder, I'm going to be an elder. No, then it's the wrong thing. It's the wrong motive that you have. So it's not just because you meet the qualifications that you have to be an elder. Because everyone is supposed to meet the qualifications. His qualifications not, it's just, oh, for being an elder, then you have to do this. No, everyone should meet those qualifications. Tell me, list one qualification that a man should not have. Oh, this is not for you. You, you, you can have unruly children. Or you can have this. No, it's not for you. No, it's all for you. It's all for all the men. If not, men will not want to meet the qualifications just because they don't want to be an elder. Because once you meet, oh wait, you meet all the qualifications, you must be an elder. Right there. You meet the qualifications, so you must be an elder. Then people will be like, ah, I don't have this qualification yet. You see, so it should not be by constraint. Amen? This is uh, it's also different from persuading someone, right? Look at the case of Moses. You know, it's as if God was like, oh, Moses, you have to do it. It's as if Moses did not want to do it, right? It's, <laughs> Moses did not appear like someone's desiring the work. Don't think that Moses was pursu- like uh, was in constraints to do it, right? You have to understand the times you live in, and that could be a sermon for another day. But God is always looking for someone to fill the gap. I sought for a man. Right? So don't say, oh, but it's not by force. Yeah. <laughs> God's looking for a man. If not, everyone will be destroyed. If not, you too, you suffer. So uh, you have to understand that. It reminds me of my days, my young, youth, youthful days. I'm still young anyway. When I was younger, <laughs> and uh, in, in, in fact, all the way from middle school, I don't know what it's called here, but what we call it, uh, elementary school to high school or secondary school, as we say. I was a class captain from grade one all the way to grade five. And I went into boarding house, or maybe in grade six, I don't know what, how it's calculated here. But I went to boarding house in GSS1, Junior Secondary School 1. And in GS1, it's all boys school, boarding house, and I was just automatic class captain. It's just, I, was hap- I happened to be tall, all boys school, so all of that. So, so I was like, oh yeah, you'll be the class captain. So I was a class captain. Yeah, I was like, it's, it's not a problem. You know, it's prefect, that's what it's called. And this, remember the story I told you about when someone slapped me on my right cheek? That was what made me not to be class captain anymore. But this is what the, the, a guy came, one of the seniors came and said, your class is responsible for cleaning this area. I'm not going to watch over you. Who is the class captain? And they're like, Obi is the class captain. So I came out. He says, I want you to make sure your classmates, they clean this area. Do you hear me? To show you I'm serious, let me slap you. Like, <laughs> I know, that's how I got a slap, a very dirty slap. And just to, and I was so mad after that. I was like, make sure you guys clean this place. You know, like, that's what they were kind of, that's the idea of the whole thing. To get me angry so that nobody messes up. So after that, I was like, I'm not a class captain. But nobody else could be the class captain. So I still remain a class captain. <laughs> so that was by constraint, not willingly. <laughs> Clearly. So every time I read that, that picture of me, I remember when I didn't want to be the, <laughs> the leader of this class. I was class captain throughout. Uh, so not for filthy looker, but of a ready mind. Filthy looker just means money. You're not doing this for money. This is not one of the, uh, this is not a career that you say, oh, you, you don't hear parents saying, and maybe these days they do, but you don't hear parents saying, hey, I want you to grow up and become a pastor so that you can make money. You know, But people are like, oh, I want to grow up and become a doctor to become this. It's not necessarily because they think they'll be sick one day and you perform surgery on them, but it's because money, right? So this should not be, you don't become a pastor for money. Um, and it's not saying that pastors should not be paid well. In fact, when it's talking about those that rule well should be worthy of double honor, it's literally talking about money, <laughs> right? Paying them well. But open to Second Corinthians chapter 12. The better you are at this job, 
understand that there's a higher risk of you not being paid well, you being paid less money. The better you are at this job, the, uh, you'll be attacked more. The better you are, remember, that's what I mean. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul was not taking money from the Corinthians, uh, but he was robbing others to service them. And it was almost a disservice to them because they were taking him for granted. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, the Bible says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. So that is the mindset you should have becoming a pastor. I'm not seeking yours, what you have. I'm seeking you yourself. I'm seeking to make you a better person. I'm seeking to even make you wealthy, right? <laughs> I mean, in true wealth. I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children, right? And I will gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. So Paul knew exactly what he was getting into. And that's how you should be as a pastor. Uh, as, as the, as, that's how the elder should be. You should know exactly what you're getting into. And God wants against the love of money. Love of money is the root of all evil. Amen. So money should not be the major factor. Remember, with Jesus, Judas had the bag. That's the Bible verse. All right, verse 3. Neither has been lords over God's heritage, but ex is it ensamples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So, God is saying the elder in the house is not the Lord over the people of God. Open to Mark chapter 10 verse 42. Yes, there should be orderliness in the house of God, and but the pastor is not over any man in the house of God. The pastor is over the running of the house of God, behavior in the house of God, what should happen in the house of God. It's not over a person or a man or a household in the house of God. Amen? In Mark chapter 10, verse 42, the Bible says, But Jesus called unto them and said unto them, because they were struggling, who sits next to me and next to, you know, struggling for authority or for hierarchy. And Jesus said unto them, verse 42, Ye know that they which are counted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they are great ones exercise authority over the, upon them. But so, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. So as you're struggling in hierarchy to become pastor and to become deacon, understand that that is a position of service, a position of servanthood. You know, you should lead, you should have a servant leadership mindset. The exact example that Jesus gave. So that's a kind of uh, example. And remember, he was saying, this is how the Gentiles are doing. Who is Paul, uh, Peter writing to? To the Gentiles. Because that's the mindset that they have. Oh, so the pastor is now the guy that is going to lord it over everybody. That's the same mindset they have. And Peter remembered what Jesus said. Oh, this is how the Gentiles do. This is not how, you know, oh, so, hey, don't do it this way. Right? So that's just how the world thinks. So it's not just like when I say Gentiles, I'm just saying the world, those that do not grow up with the laws of God. In fact, you're supposed to judge what I say. Open to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Judge what I say because the Bible, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 15 says, I speak to, as to wise men, judge what I say. So you, you ought to judge me and say, hey, you're not doing your job right. Or you're not, so I'm serving you, right? That's, that's what the Bible says. So the pastor should be an example also. Should be an example. The elder should be an example to the people. So if you're going to tell them to lift something, make sure you're lifting it with one of your fingers. Don't be like the Pharisees, right? First Timothy chapter 4 verse 11. The Bible says, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So in word, in conversation. That's not a repetition. Conversation means way of life, right? So in words, in, in what you're doing, in your way of life. So you should be an example. So let no man despise their youth. Yes, you're called an elder. You could be a young man, but you're an elder. So be an example. Don't just say, oh, but I'm too young. Be an example. So the elder there is just synonymous for bishop or pastor. So it's not about the age of the pastor. It's about the qualifications and you being able to fulfill the duty. So what's part of the duty? Being an example. It's not just, oh, I have all this knowledge of the Bible, but don't do as I do, do as I say. Oh, I know you should go to soul winning, but you know, I don't go soul winning. 
but yeah, I can preach so many, but I don't do it. Oh, I know you should do this, but I don't do that. No, if you cannot do it, then you cannot be a pastor because you should be an example also. So that's what he's telling them. Jesus spent three, about three years teaching the disciples, uh, being an example, basically. Jesus spent three years teaching disciples servant leadership, showing them how they should wash the feet of, of their people, of, their, of the, of the uh, followers, um, I guess. Of the, they should love each other, you know? So clearly, the pastor is not the chief shepherd, shepherd as the Bible says, because the chief shepherd is the head of the church. The chief shef, shepherd the chief shepherd is Jesus Christ. And um, so the pastor is uh, is more like one of the children in charge when the parent is away. So just look at it that way. So just one of the children. So why are you listening to what the child said? Because you heard the parent tell the child that this is what you should do. You heard. It's not like, oh, I received the word. Let me tell you guys, an angel appeared to me. Right? How many religions started that way? An angel appeared to me and told me these words, and I wrote them down. So follow what I say. You can marry a nine-year-old. No, sorry, a six-year-old. You can marry them. Just for now. <laughs> right? Follow what I say. It's an angel that told me. No. It's the same word that I'm following that you guys are hearing. Right? We all heard the same word. We're all reading the same Bible. And I'm following it. So this is what daddy said. So let's, daddy said I should tell you that you should do this. <laughs> Basically, that's how the pastor is ruling. That's how the pastor is teaching. So, we have the under shepherd and just, you know, put in charge to rule the house. Right? But God is the head and he's here. He is here. He's here. He's, he's everywhere. So, he's listening. He's watching. So, that's who the pastor is. And pastors will receive their rewards for the labor they are, they are doing. Just like every other church member. So, oh, I want to strike you a pastor because then I'll get much, much more rewards. Yes, you have the opportunity to get much more, more rewards because obviously, I mean, you're doing a lot of work. But it does, I can guarantee you that in heaven, people will be surprised. There are some people that will get more rewards than pastors. He said, oh, but okay, maybe it's just men that are evangelists doing so. Win. There are some women that will get more rewards than, than men, and they are pastors too. Yes, I can guarantee you that. Because it's not just, oh, once you're a pastor, then you have all, more rewards than everybody in church. No, you can, you know, that's why I say, God did not make the position so that, oh, everyone wants to be just so that they can be great or be great in heaven and rule many people in heaven. No. That, that's not why you should get a position. Just work for the Lord. Where the talent God has given you, He has given some pastors, some evangelists, some teachers, some apostles. We don't have apostles anymore. But, yeah, so, so, so um, just work where you've been given your capacity and you find yourself among kings, right? Not among mean men, as the Bible says. And believe you me, Jesus said, first shall be last and the last shall be first. So, be careful about that. That's why the pastor wants to leave last. Because <laughs> the last will be first. I'm just kidding. Anyway, verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisted the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. So, now he's left off from the pastors, now from the elders, and he's now talking to the younger ones. So, submit yourselves unto the elder. I believe this is, you know, to the pastors, and the young should submit to the older, literally. So, we should be subject to higher powers, right? Church members submit to the pastor's rule in accordance to the Bible, and I also believe it applies to younger people respecting your elders, including the pastor, right? Oh, pastor is not just, oh, because I'm the pastor, everyone has to respect me, I don't have to respect anybody. See, I respect my elders too, even in the church, you respect your elders, you greet them, I mean, you treat the older ones as fathers, treat the younger ones as brothers, and the children as, you know, children, I guess. So, respect your elders, and we should be subject one to another. See, humility solves a lot of problems. I can guarantee you this. Every sin is rooted in pride. Just dig deep enough. Pride is a problem. Every sin. Just keep digging, and you find out, yeah, that is pride. Oh, you, uh, you, oh, I just want more money. It's because, why do you think you want more money? Because, I mean, look at me. I deserve more money. Uh, pride, right there. <laughs> oh, I want more money because I can make more money. Oh, pride. It's not God that gave you power to make wealth. If he tells you not to desire to be rich. You see, every sin, you can... Oh, why did you lie? Pride, because you were ashamed. You didn't want people to shame you, so you lied. I mean, pick a sin. It's rooted in pride. Oh, I can get this because I can get it. I can do this because I can do it. So it's all rooted in pride. So that's why the Bible says be humble, humility, have humility. Uh, God hates pride. Even the proud look, he hates it. The proud
proud look. So clothe yourself with humility. Don't even look proud. <laughs> That's what the Bible is saying. Amen. In Proverbs 16 verse 5, the Bible says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not go unpun he shall not be unpunished. So everyone that is proud in the heart. That means his inside is an abomination. That means God is looking at your heart. Yes, he hates the proud look, uh, but the heart too, you should not have pride in your heart. Clothe yourself in humility and should affect what is in the inside should come out on the outside. So don't just hide pride in your heart and say, you know, I'm better than everybody here, but you know, I'll just mingle with the mere folks, right? That's in your heart. Don't do that because pride in heart, see, no hand join your hand. That means you can confederate yourself with many people against the Lord. You will not go unpunished. That's what the Bible says. That's how much he hates pride. Verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You know, James, the book of James, uh, James says the same things in his letters concerning pride. And I'm not going to touch all of that, but you can read James. You can finish James in what? 20 minutes, 15 minutes? Just start reading and finish it up. Um, Jesus also said in Matthew 23 verse 12, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So, humble yourself and you'll be abased. Sorry. Humble yourself and you'll be exalted in due time. That's what Peter is telling them. So, exalted what? In due time. Because the times and the seasons are not up to you. You say, oh, once I humble myself, then I, God's supposed to exalt. What's happening, God? Yeah. You've not exalted me. You, know, you, you wait. Patience, right? <laughs> you know, times are sitting in the hands of God. So be patient. So you say, oh, but I've, I've humbled myself, but I'm suffering. You're suffering? Look at what the next verse says. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You see? He'll exalt you in due time. Just cast all your cares upon him. Be prayerful. Just, yes, I'm, I'm humble myself. I'm suffering all the insults. I'm suffering all the days you know, all of that. Remember, being meek does not mean that, you know, you're weak, right? Don't, oh, I'm, I'm humble and I'm meek and everything, then you take that, in fact, I don't want to digress on my sermon, but cast all your cares upon him, right? And uh, he cared for you, that's what the Bible says. So be prayerful. The Bible says, call upon me in the times of trouble. So times of trouble, call upon him. Just be humble, and God wants us to understand that He cares. Open to Luke chapter 12, verse 6. Luke chapter 12, verse 6. Because sometimes you might forget that God cares. You just think, oh, He died for me, so He's telling me to do this. He doesn't really care how much I suffer. All He tells me is, my grace is sufficient for you. And did I die for you? Come on, do that what I'm telling you to do. You know, No, He cares. He cares how you feel. He cares about your emotions. He knows that you're flesh. He knows that we're human. He, he, he truly cares for us. The Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, and not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are more, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So five sparrows are sold for two fattens. In fact, in Matthew, it says two sparrows are sold for one fatten. Right? Five sparrows. It's kind of like if you buy in multiple, you know, you get discount. Anyway. Actually, you see, nothing is new under the sun, folks. I just thought about that right now. <laughs> if you buy, because Jesus said this many times, obviously, that's why I have it different ways in the gospel. It's not like, oh, one made a mistake. Jesus said it in one way, because I remember two, two sparrows, someone should check that, check that later on anyway. Two sparrows for one fatten, and the same thing he said. And five sparrows for two fattens. You see, if you buy five. You know, you save save some money. Anyway, where was I? I don't like digressing so much, but <laughs> maybe I like it. I showed myself. Um, so it says, even the very hairs of your head are counted. That number just means counted. So God knows the number of the very hairs of your head. Each it's numbered. You think, oh, He doesn't care about you. He cares so much about you that He knows how many thousands or millions of hair strands that you have, <laughs> depending on how bald you are. Um, <laughs> Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a, sorry, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So, the devil is our 
adversary. The devil is our enemy. The Bible makes that very clear. And something that you might not have, uh, well, I guess you should catch, but something that's very clear also is that the devil is not omnipresent. The devil is not everywhere at every time. He's only one place at one time. So that's a very great teaching. That, that got me out of franchise churches. You know, like all churches should be under one person because that's what the devil wants. He wants to control all the churches by one person on top. So once you get to that person on top, then you've gotten all the churches. But if there are different churches with their own elders, then you cannot just get one church and you've gotten all the rest. You just got one and everyone will be like, hey, that should be a tale for you. Don't do this. Don't do that. Then they leave that guy. <laughs> Everybody there that has sense will leave that church and go to the right church. right? But if everyone is on that one church and that one great guy, one guy is the Pope and all of that. Yeah, Pope, literally. And the, all the devil has to do is to get that guy. And that guy says, anything I say, anything I describe the Bible or preach about the Bible is correct. And people follow him. He has gotten all these other churches. So, but Jesus, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at every time. He's right here. So, Jesus is in this church, and Jesus in that church, that church, that church. He doesn't need all the churches to come on that one. All the churches will eventually come on that one. But that's it. Jerusalem, Zion, heaven, where we all, we all meet and we we'll go and worship God in, in Zion. But it's not here in this, in this present world. Okay? So they are churches. So the devil is not omnipresent. The devil is our adversary. And the Bible says he's as a roaring lion. What does that mean? See, a lion roars to show power, to scare off his enemies. So a lion wants, he, when a lion roars five miles, you know what five miles is? <laughs> you can hear it five miles away. A roaring lion. So he's scaring off his enemies, telling them, hey, I'm ready. Lions are pretty strong. I mean, they, they are not afraid. Like one ca characteristic of a lion is that they are bold. A lion, he's, he, he might not be able to win the battle, but he's not going to run away from the battle. <laughs> He will fight to the death, you know. So that, that's something about a lion. And when they start running, like, and the other animals, they are not they are not trying to hurt themselves. I mean, they cheat out, chase somebody, and I'm tired. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm done. I'll find something else. You know, a lion is is, is a different kind of beast. God made him that way. Uh, eat that way, I should say. So he's showing. He's trying to show off power. And remember, we just sang a hymn that there's no power that matches the devil. What's, what is the hymn number? 144, right? I just saw that. It's interesting. We're, we're saying the same thing. I'm not saying the hymn now is the Bible. I'm just saying somebody else agrees with this. Um, where is it? It's the last line of the first one. Uh, his craft. It's talking about the devil. In fact, let's start from here. For still our ancient foe, because the devil has been there from the beginning, that old serpent, right? That's what the Bible calls it. Ancient foe, doth seek to walk us woe. That means he wants to bring woe unto us. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Him 144. On earth is not his equal. So the guy is powerful. As a roaring lion, he's like, he's out, you know, roaring. I don't want to roar for you guys. <laughs> he's a god of this world. That means he's powerful. I mean, he was tempting Jesus with you know the riches of the world. And there's his spiritual wickedness in high places, the prince of the power of the air. I mean, everyone that is not saved is working under that disobedience of the prince of the power of the air. So that's how powerful he is. So he's as a roaring lion. So the Bible says, us, be sober and vigilant. What does that mean? You see, you have to be, you have to watch out for the lion. You have to open, listen, L look, understand his devices. You know his plots. Watch out. You know, remember in Nigeria, you, I have to because I grew up in Nigeria. When we're living in our huts, we have to be listening. To where if, if we see a lion, like we have, we have to be careful. And when we see a lion, we climb up on the tree and we hide. So a lion will pass, especially when the adults are not around, right? So we have to be. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking, right? <laughs> First time I saw a lion is here in America, believe you or not, in the Philadelphia Zoo. Now people think in Nigeria we live next to lions and stuff. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to say that with a straight face. My wife was not helping out. <laughs> okay, God is saying... <laughs> We should watch out for the devil. <laughs> be sober, be vigilant, because a lion is a dangerous enemy, right? I never saw a lion in Nigeria, I want to be clear. <laughs> for 18 years I grew up there, I never saw a lion. <laughs> 
So as we have, and I didn't live in huts too. I actually lived in nice houses. <laughs> With fenced walls, uh, fenced compounds. Anyway, a, a delight, the devil is a dangerous enemy. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us. And he's powerful. So he's as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And God is telling us to be sober, be vigilant. So as we approach the end times, it's as if we're backing this lion to the wall. And he's going to come out here. She's going to come out with anger. He's going to come out. And we're approaching the end times. So we're backing him to the wall. He knows it's time. And remember, lions don't just give up a fight, they'll fight to the death. So, being sober also means, being sober, yes, I said that, being sober means avoid substances that mess with your thinking faculty and your judgment. Avoid alcohol, avoid drugs, you have to be sober. Avoid, even, when I say avoid drugs too, I mean drink uh, weed also, oh, but weed has medicine, avoid weed, it messes with your thinking faculty, it's a gateway drug to other drugs, so be careful about that. Avoid let's have alcohol too. Avoid drinking too much wine. Oh, let's say wine. Juice. I want to be very specific. Don't drink too much juice. Avoid that. Open to First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy chapter three. As you open there, I'll take you back a little bit. In First Peter chapter four, verse three, the Bible says, "For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, in uh, lost excess of wine." Revelings, banquetings, and abominable idol idolatries. So excess of wine. Wine is also juice. Excess of it is not good. In First Timothy chapter 3, remember, the, the uh, qualifications of a bishop is for every man. Right? Qualifications of a deacon is for every man. It's not just for pastors or deacons. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, one of the quali uh, uh, qualifications there is not giving to wine. No striker, not greedy or filthy looker, but patient, not a brawler, but covetous. You say, well, not giving to wine there means not giving to alcohol. Yeah, I mean, yeah, not giving to alcohol. Yeah. When you say not giving to something, means you, you don't just, you're not excessing that thing, right? So I believe it's talking about juice. Why do I say so? Jump to verse 8. The same qualifications for a deacon, right? And the deacons own in verse 8 says, Likewise must the deacon, likewise means just as the pastors, just as the bishops, likewise must the deacons be grave, that means sober, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy or filthy looker. So the bishop should not drink alcohol. But the deacon, you're not a bishop, you're a deacon. So you can drink alcohol just a little bit, not too much. You see, that's not what he's saying. <laughs> he's saying not giving to wine. I means not giving to juice. Not you're, you're just giving to it. Uh, the deacons not giving to. He's saying the same thing. Not giving too much wine. He's, he's just saying the same thing. Remember, it is a man talking to, and God is using him. And so, not giving too much wine. He's saying not giving to too much juice. Right? Bible tells us that. Um, what else? Sleep. How can you be sober? Have a good sleeping schedule. You, you walk, 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 walk. You're not sober. You cannot read your Bible. You cannot watch out for the tricks of the, 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 the devices of the enemy. God wants us to be physically sound too. Remember, part of the burden of sin is no soundness of the flesh. <laughs> it's written it's in the Bible everywhere. So sleep well, eat well, always be in the optimum gear. Always. It's just like driving stick shift, right? When you want to cruise, you can put it you know, like the last gears or one of the last gears and you're just cruising. You know at any point you cannot just accelerate because you lock the engine, if anyone knows what I'm talking about. So, but if you want to always be in optimum gear, uh, optimum gear, ready for anything, then you put it in the middle gear when you're cruising. Then you can accelerate at any time and slow down at any time, right? So always, you're always in the optimum gear. Don't just put your, your stuff, or your, your life on the last gear, on the cruise gear and just, and just stay there. No, be sober. Be ready because your your adversary, the devil, has a royal lion seeking whom he may devour. Amen. All right, verse nine. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So, what are we to do when we see this royal lion? What are we to do when? Oh yeah, you're you're sober, you're watching, right? And you see what are you supposed to do? Resist, stand fast. Amen. Resist, stand. Open to Ephesians chapter six. The Bible says, "Resist the devil, and he will flee from you." Right? This royal lion. When it says a royal lion, it doesn't literally mean that. Okay, he can 
overpower you and because we have who can be against us if God is for us right our life is hid in Christ so it's anything God wants the devil does not have the authority to do any harm to us he's more powerful than us right but the authority he's under the authority of God just as Job God told the devil you cannot don't touch his life Right? But the devil had the power to do that. But God told him, don't. same with us. In fact, the devil came to God, and God was talking about Job. And the devil said, but you have a wall of fire. You have a hedge. You have a wall around him. <laughs> right? I cannot come near him. So that's how we are, too. So when you see the devices of the enemy, not to fall for his deceptions or his tricks, because it's us that will harm ourselves by falling for his tricks. Then he will accuse us against God. Then the word of God will come down against us. That's how it works. And how does the word of God come down? God will tell the devil, go and do my work. The devil is working for God, guys. Amen? All right. So uh, when you see his devices, stand fast. Stand fast. Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and on and on and on, the armor of God. So God is saying, stand, stand, stand. When you see, the, when you, you, with the wiles of the devil, the tricks of the devil, God wants us to stand. He doesn't want us to fall. And he that thinketh to stand, take heed lest he falls. <laughs> Open to Romans chapter 12. So, uh, resist, uh, uh, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So, I've said this many times. Remember, every suffering you're going through, every temptation you're going through is common to man. Sufferings as a Christian is a normal thing. You're going through, the same afflictions are going through, uh, your brethren in the world are suffering that. So, saved people are going through the same thing. And Bible tells us Romans chapter 12, Sorry, I say Romans. I wrote Romans here, but I mean Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also, sorry, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin, and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author, author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So God is saying, we have all these examples. What examples? If you remember the previous chapter, chapter 11, all the examples of what people suffered. You know, what well, they went through, lions and fires and all of that. So all those examples is a great cloud of witness. So your brethren in the world are suffering the same thing. So that's what the Bible is telling us. All right, verse 10. It's a time. But the God of all grace, who had called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, that means we're saved. God has called us and we're saved. After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right. So after that you have suffered a while, open to James chapter 1. We need patience. Because when you suffer a while, it means you've gone through patience. Then God can make you perfect. In James chapter 1, you need patience for perfection. James chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of our faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting not, nothing. So, let patience have a perfect work. So, after ye have suffered a while, what will he do? He will establish you, he will be perfect, he will establish you, strengthen you, settle you. So, get established, get grounded on the right foundation, know your purpose, know your calling, strengthen, equip, be equipped to handle these diverse temptations, equip yourself. 
uh, settled. See, you've arrived in your promised land, right? We're saved. Don't start, start heading to Egypt. Stay where God told you to stay. Get settled. Establish your roots where you are. Settle down. Then you have the peace that passes all understanding. Hey, for example, I'm looking for a church. I want to get settled. You found IFB, Independent Fundamental Baptist. What they believe, you see the fundamentals, they believe in the Bible, all the beliefs, all the, the core uh, beliefs of the IFB. Okay, they settle. Now you're settled. Find a particular church so they can settle in. So I know it's IFB. I cannot now look for another church. There's none this, none that, none contempt, none, I don't know what the other church, none this or none, what do you call that thing? Non denominational. There you go. All this non denominational church, community this, community that. So settle that say an IFB church is, uh, I, I want to find uh, an IFB particular church, and you settle down there. Settle where you live. Find, uh, buy, buy your house or live in a house and say, I'm settled, I'm living in this state. Not, who? Oh, I'm living in Pennsylvania now. I don't know. Maybe I should move there or move here. You know, I don't know where I'm going to raise my children yet. I'm still, no, settle. God wants us settled so that we can put in roots, we can grow, we can be fruitful. That's why he wants us settled. For, for example, in your career, choose a career path, settle, choose a job, and settle in that job. Grass is not always green on the other side. I said always. Sometimes it could be. But it's not always greener. But don't just be hopping from one job to another job because you don't like how that guy talked to you yesterday. Really? And that guy's going to talk to you another way. You know? Or you leave this church because I don't like that family. That family, they didn't really say hi when I came in. Another family is not going to say hi to you in another church. So settle. That, that's not your problem. Your problem should be the core, the, the, the core the meanings and foundations of the church. Amen? Or of the job. My point is God just wants us to settle, not just moving up and down. Yes, but he told Abraham to move, but he told Abraham to settle at a particular point. And that's where his descendants are to stay. Brought them back to that land. You see that? So once you found the right place, then you settle. All right, verse 12. By Sylvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, <laughs> I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. So Sylvanus, that's also known as Silas, wrote the actual words of this letter. So Peter was dictating, to, di dictating it to him. Just as Peter says in the second episode, that the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's what Peter said. So him too, he was speaking, and someone was writing it down. So he spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So clearly we see here that Sylvanus wrote the actual words. Peter spoke the words. The Holy Spirit, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So therefore, it is God that wrote the Bible. And sometimes when people say, oh, how do, how do you know God wrote the Bible? Or why do you say God wrote the Bible? Uh, do I have time? Anyway, I can, I can teach another time. It's, I think it's Exodus 30 and 31. God first wrote, the lit literally with his handwriting, wrote on the tablet, the Ten Commandments. And Moses had the audacity to break it. <laughs> Uh, I guess he, has, he met with God and spoke with God face to face, so he has the audacity, I guess. His head was shiny too, so. Anyway, he has the audacity to break it. And this God, God, I understand why you broke it. I mean, it was really annoying. So God told him, I'm going to write it again. I mean, read it. He said, I'm going to write it again. Then when he was going to write it again, what did God say? Write this. So what God lying when he said I was going to write it, you think he didn't know the end from the beginning? So when God tells a man to write something, it is him that wrote it. It's just like you saying Sylvanus is one that wrote first Peter. <laughs> Who wrote it? Peter. You see that? So it's Peter, it's the book of Peter. You don't say, oh, it's Sylvanus that wrote it though. Okay, if we're going in that route, Sylvanus wrote it. What did he use to write it? His blood? <laughs> it's the pen that wrote it. Uh, oh, what is, it? is it the feather that wrote it? It's the ink that wrote it. <laughs> oh, where did we get the ink? It's the crude oil that wrote it. How far do you want to go? <laughs> okay, so, all right, let's stop there. Um, so, exhorting and testifying. So, what was he saying? I've written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein he stands. So what is Peter doing? Peter is confirming the churches. That's what he's doing. Because in Acts of the Apostles, uh, as you, in the book of Acts of the Apostles, 
You see that the apostles, they went out, they went to other churches, confirming the church. What does confirming the churches mean? It means making them stand on right foundation, uh, establishing them, exhorting them, strengthening them at what they believe. Then, um, yes, it's right what you're doing. This is why you had other preachers going to other churches, confirming the churches, establishing them, encouraging them. Like, yes, you're right. Don't think you're the only ones that go so willing, right? <laughs> so willing is right. This is what we're supposed to do. You know, pastor has been saying it over and over again. Next day, guest means I'll come here and say, so willing is right. Yes! Amen. Why did you say that when I was saying it? <laughs> right? So I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's, it's, it's encouraging to see another person come up and say, Yes, so we need that's how she are. like, Yeah, so the apostle is right. You know, I can't. Yeah, anyway, yeah, confirming the churches. That's what Peter was doing. Exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. So it's, for, it's free. Yeah, it's free. It's the true grace of God. Yeah, that's what it is. Wherein ye stand. So you're standing on the right place. So he's confirming them. Verse 13. The church that is at Babylon, elect, elected together with you, salute, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Uh, open to Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 24. So the church that is at Babylon. Now, Babylon should not have inhabitants. <laughs> the place should be desolate. I'm talking about physical Babylon, like actual where Babylon was. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah 51, verse 24, and I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyed all the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and will make thee a burnt mountain. And they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations, but thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. So it's talking about Babylon is to be desolate forever. So God was actually talking about the physical land, those people, that that place, all right, that's going to be desolate forever. But there's something called the spirit of Babylon. That is it's the same spirit that was in Babel, in Syria, Egypt, all the rulers, the, the, the empire that rules the world. You know, the spirit that was in Persia, called the Prince of Persia. That's a Babylonian spirit. So when it says, uh, the church is in Babylon, it's talking about Rome, because Rome was the empire that was ruling the world during the time of Peter. So it's just the churches in Rome, or Italy. In fact, is in Peter also that it says Italy, was in Hebrews. Anyway. So the churches in Rome greet you. So it says Babylon is not talking about you know, the physical land of Babylon. Just want to make that clear. And where is that spirit right now? The spirit right now is resting on America. I mean, America is the new world order, right? The leader of the free world, as I say. So greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you. Uh, uh, peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, in some areas, you know, in, some areas in some other epistles, Paul is saying, greet one another with a holy kiss. Right? Now, Peter is saying, greet, greet with a piece of charity. Is it a different kind of kiss, like French kiss? And, you know, what, what, what are these kisses? <laughs> You know, my kids asked me that question before. <laughs> anyway, I believe, because when it says kiss of charity, holy kiss, I believe it's saying, it's referring to the conversation, the interaction you have within brethren. It's not talking about a particular kind of kiss. So greet one another with the kiss of charity. How do you kiss somebody and show the person I love you, right? It's by your deeds. How do you show you love the person? So that's how you greet, that's how you interact with each other. Amen? You, you know, and they can greet in any way they want to greet because God uh, likes cultures, you know, different cultures. I mean, some people handshake, some people lie down on the floor. I don't know what they do. But God <laughs> likes, uh, God takes any culture, uh, as long as it's not seen against God, as long as it's not uh, going against the word of God. But um, what he's saying, it should be in charity, in love. It should be holy, in a sense, separate unto the Lord, right? That's how we greet each other. So what is separate unto the Lord? The things that God commands us to do, right? So it's talking about a conversation, holy, separate it unto the Lord. All right, I'm going to end here. Uh, this is the end of First Peter, and next week we're going to Second Peter. I just want to finish the letters of Peter. It's just three chapters for Second Peter, so we'll go through that. All right, let's bow down our heads. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for teaching us your word. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the final exhortations uh, that Peter gave here. It'll touch a lot of things: the pastor, the young ones, uh, well, uh, even Babylon, all the way there. Thank you, Lord.
Lord, for showing us all these things. I pray, Lord, that you help us to learn them, help us to understand them more and more. Uh, help us, Lord, to put them to practice. Continue to bless us, continue to keep us as a church, continue to provide for us also and protect us even in these uh, evil days. And um, I pray, Lord, the next time we meet you to be to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.